Hi, my name is Christy Winters. I, in 2010, conducted the qualitative election study of Britain, which was the first time anyone had systematically done qualitative research in all three nations. And uh, that's where I met Nzia, and we started to work together, and then we put together this collaboration to do uh, a qualitative election study for 2015. But because we had this tradition, we applied for money to study the referendum. Unfortunately, we could only do it after all of the events because that's when the funding came up. But we wanted to still record for posterity this very important event. And that was what in, was our motivation for the focus groups. So, from our side of it, you know, um, the, we had some great quant quantitative. You look at numbers, you look at survey results, and this is also very important for us to have a good idea of what is happening. But our research agenda involves the idea that instead of researchers setting the questions, we should be listening to people. So that's what our approach is, is that we ask people questions and then we listen. And what we wanted to focus on in this research was the notion of identity and the way that being Scottish and British was balanced, people's opinion on the future of Scotland post-referendum, and on the politics of Scotland and the UK. And with this opportunity, it would also give people a chance to look at the campaign itself in retrospect, give their memories of it, give their impressions. And uh, again, our attempt is not only to understand this referendum for today, but to document this process. So we're going to deposit our data in the UK Data Archive. Future generations will be able to go back and look at this information. What were people thinking about during the Scottish referendum? what was important to them. So just to summarize the things that drove us, we wanted to know about people's views of independence before the vote, the issues or events that they recall standing out and being important, helping them making up their minds. What were kind of the considerations that they had when they were going through the decision-making process? What was their experience of the actual vote itself? Their reactions to the results and what those results they feel meant for them and meant for the future of Scotland. And in terms of why the study matters, this was a historic event. <laughs> and that was why we were so keen to get out there and talk to ordinary people so that it's not just newspapers that you have to rely on in, in the future. You can actually find the views of real people. We wanted to record those for posterity and also understand them and to find out if there's more common ground with which to have a conversation as we move forward. So we're not going to focus only on the things that divided people but it's been very much part of our research agenda here to also see what things were common to both groups, the common aims, the common values, and the common commitments. In order to recruit participants, just so that you know, we were really interested in Dundee. So the funding that we received from the Carnegie Foundation was about public engagement. And we thought that given that Dundee was one of the places that had the highest yes uh, responses, that it made a lot of sense people in the community would want to get some reflection back and hear what people in their community had said about this experience. And so we focused it here on the Dundee area. Um, we wanted a good range of people so that we had a lot of different experiences, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different um, perspectives. We used the university website because obviously that's free to us and available on you. But we also uh, wanted to look outside so that we could get older people, middle-aged people like me, and younger people, men and women, people from all different political backgrounds. So we used Facebook, Twitter, social media, and Ezio was on the radio, and that actually was great because we had a lot of people who signed up for the groups once they heard about the study, because that was the other thing. Our participants who came were amazing. And yes, we did give them a financial incentive, but I think all of them would have stayed longer than 90 minutes and kept talking if we would have wanted them. And uh, it's been really fantastic. They were so open and, and giving with their experiences and their opinions. So we held it on campus on a weekend in order to make it more accessible for full-time workers and people with kids. We had five focus groups that ran 90 minutes each. And we had a separate group because we wanted people in the group to feel safe saying things. Um, so we had yes voters in one group, no voters in another group, and then we had yes campaigners and no campaigners because we felt that um, that would allow for more sympathetic or empathetic exchanges between the members of the focus groups. And in terms of what we found out, for today's talk, we're going to break it up into basically three little parts. 
as he's going to talk about similarities and differences for people that were in our groups here in Dundee. The division that we found between the head and the heart. And now I'm going to come back on the last bit and talk about winning and losing. In other words, the day of the election and how do people react to the results. So what really uh, made us sit up and pay attention was the similarities that we found between the yes and the no voters. And we didn't expect that because there was so much about divisiveness and how the campaign and the referendum divided people. Um, and therefore, when we found the similarities, we found um, we were really, really surprised. Um, and pleasantly surprised, I should say. So the yes and the no voters in our focus groups expressed these views. Um, it was not just another election for both sets of voters. Um, there was an element of self-education, and I will explain what that is. Um, they were impacted through their interactions with other people. Um, and there were feelings of hurt and betrayal on both sides. Um, there were differences in the details, so their perceptions of the campaigns and the perceptions of the other voters. Let's look at the similarities. So in terms of it not being just another election, ev almost everybody that we spoke to in the focus groups were very aware of how important this referendum was for them. They felt that uh, the question of the referendum was a final question. It was not another election in, in the sense that they can't come back to this question five years later. If there was a finality to the vote that they would give. Uh, there were no conventions or platforms. So they felt that they, it was their responsibility to find out more. They felt very much responsible about their vote. Um, and they felt that they were forced to pick a side. It was a yes or a no. There was nothing in between. Whereas when you vote for an election, we were told, you had a choice. You could pick and choose between different parties. This was a very clear choice for them. There was nothing in the middle, no gray area. And therefore, they felt that they had to educate themselves. So both yes and no voters that spoke to us reported that they were searching for facts. They were searching for information. Um, they went to news websites. They went on Facebook. They went on Twitter. They spoke to people. They went to meetings. Both voters, uh, both sets of voters reported that they were uh, trying to find out more because they felt so responsible with their vote. Um, in fact, in terms of using social media, we had the very amazing um, experience of finding two older yes voters who became net savvy. You know, they decided that they would use Facebook, they would use Twitter, and so this idea that social media is a youth phenomenon didn't really match up to what our, our focus groups participants were telling us. Um, other similarities, this um, impact through personal and professional interactions. And this probably you are also familiar with in terms of your own um, anecdotal experience. Um, the referendum definitely affected personal relationships. It affected friendships and affected family relations. So we have a male focus group participant who was a late decider who said he went off Facebook because he just couldn't handle the abuse. He couldn't handle the level of discussion. Um, another uh, female focus group participant said that she actually lied to her partner about how she voted because he voted in a different way and she couldn't bear telling him how she voted. Um, another female voter said she couldn't talk to her friends about her decision and she felt that if she would, she would feel attacked. And so she just kept quiet when they kept talking about their experiences. Professional relationships. We have a woman who was a yes campaigner who felt very isolated at work because she felt that her uh, colleagues were voting in a different way. Uh, a student who said that uh, when she came to university, the first question that she would be asked by her other students was, what are you studying? But the second question would be, how are you voting? Um, and in fact, she felt that that question was actually asking her, depending on how you answer, am I going to talk to you again? So it was that person, it was that much uh, of an impact that people felt both in their personal and professional relationships, both for yes and no voters. Um, and finally, and this is what really got us, that there were hurt feelings and betrayal on both sides. So the yes voters who spoke to us felt, and we felt, that they were saying, they felt betrayed by the Westminster system. Right? This idea of media bias. Uh, we have a male voter who said, I keep coming back to the power of the BBC, and they really swung it for the campaign. It was heartening that there was no control over social media, so I could find out facts for myself. 
about what independence would mean for Scotland. Um, the UK uh, Parliament, uh, it was felt by our, vote, uh, by our uh, participants that they were spreading lies about so the future of Scotland, what, what that would mean uh, if Scotland got independence. And so we have a female voter saying uh, about Ed Miliband's interaction with some uh, women in Glasgow. This was her uh, response to his interaction. Uh, they, which is the women in Glasgow, are asking valid questions. Answer them. They might not agree with your answers, but be respectful, answer them. So this idea that the system is actually not even engaging with voters, and why isn't it engaging? Because aren't the voters like everyone else? This feeling of isolation and betrayal and feeling hurt was something that came through very clearly for us. Um, uh, the other aspect about yes voters was the differences in political views. So we have a female voter who uh, spoke about why voting yes to the referendum mattered to her. And she felt that what was happening in Dundee, especially in the aftermath of the recession, as she says, wasn't right. And that we have to go out and do something, do stuff. And what she meant was uh, about uh, what was happening with the food banks and, and about having community projects for the poor in Dundee. And she felt that this wasn't being reflected in the larger discourse, especially the discourse coming from Westminster. So this was the, uh, um, the feelings that were coming up from, the, from our yes focus group participants. What about the no focus group participants? Um, they felt that they were being told they were not Scottish enough because they were voting no. And that was something that really hurt them. So we have a uh, voter said, it's twisted logic. Because I'm voting no to independence, I'm Westminster. That makes me English. No such thing. He was very adamant about that. Um, they were heard that uh, Scottish symbols and identity to the salt I was, they felt was being appropriated for yes. And they felt that because they were Scottish, this, these symbols were theirs as well. And that they couldn't use them because they were being connected to yes. Um, English voters who were voting in Scotland felt that they were being told it was not their decision to make. So we have an English voter uh, saying, I believed this for a while. But I intend to stay here and I care about Scotland as a country, so I'm not just going to come here and mess it up out of spite just because I'm English. So she felt that she was being isolated as well because of her Englishness, let's say. Um, in terms of differences, the perceptions of the campaigns were very different among our focus group participants. So the Yes campaign, Yes voters saw the Yes campaign as being positive, as being very much grassroots efforts, as being carried by the people. No voters saw the Yes campaign as being enthusiastic, but also being aggressive. Um, in terms of how the No campaign was viewed, Yes voters felt that the No campaign had a lot of misinformation, a lot of lies. No voters felt that this was not scaremongering, but they were, being, uh, they were raising genuine concerns. Um, they were, in fact, they themselves were not happy with the way the No campaign was run. Uh, we had a participant who said that they hardly saw them or hardly heard from them. In fact, it was like a little whisper. That was the no campaign for the no voters. Uh, finally, we have differences in terms of how yes voters saw no voters and how no voters saw yes voters. So yes voters were seen as being very aggressive and passionate, both. Uh, we have a no, uh, female no voter who said that she couldn't discuss anything with her friends, uh, the referendum with her friends, for fear because they were totally in favor of yes. They were absolutely lovely people. She made sure she said that, that they were lovely people, but they were very impassioned on the referendum, and therefore she would not say anything when the debate about the referendum came up. Uh, another no uh, voter who was also a woman said that she was being abused online by yes voters, and for, their, for her, the way that they, she was being abused summed up yes voters for her, that they were aggressive. What about how yes voters saw no voters? Yes voters felt that no voters were misinformed or uninformed, uh, and that they were swayed by scaremongering. They were afraid of the future. So we have a woman yes voter who said that she was down in various yes stalls, and she part to part on the yes bus. And when she confronted or when her colleagues confronted with, were confronted with no voters, and when she asked them, why are you voting no? The response was, well, I just am. And she said, if someone asked me why you are voting yes, I could give you a list as long as my arm, because I had read about it. And I found that the no voters were not informed. Any more questions? Any more questions?
So I'll pass on the rest of the analysis to Christy. Oh, Okay, I'll continue with the analysis. So that's the bit about the similarities and the differences of perceptions between yes and no. What we did was take a couple of steps back and see how people were thinking and feeling and expressing their feelings. And what we found was very important was this tussle between the head and the heart when deciding how to vote. Both yes and no voters said that they started with an idea that they won't, wanted to vote one way. But they didn't want to vote just with their heart, again, because this was such an important decision. They said that they did not want to go on emotion or impulse, therefore they went out and sought information. We had only one initial no voter, so one person who said they initially thought they were going to vote no, and then they changed their mind after they searched for information. We didn't have any yes voter um, who said they went on to vote no. What was interesting for us is many of our focus group participants said they searched far and wide for a wide range of information. So they were not just going to the websites who would tell them what they wanted to hear. They were going to the opposition, let's say, websites. They were going and talking to other people to try and find out why are you voting differently from me? What am I missing? And they felt that that didn't sway their mind. Whatever information they got back just confirmed that they were making the right decision. So we had one yes voter who said, I decided way back. In 1979, I voted yes then. I always had known that I was going to vote yes. But then I said to myself, why am I voting yes? So I read extensively to justify why I was voting yes, that it wasn't just a gut feeling. We have a similar uh, response from our no voter. I knew immediately that I would vote no. And then I went through a whole process of analyzing myself to why I was voting no. Because I realized that it was a hard decision and really I want to get my head around this. Very similar responses from both types of voters, from both voters. Yeah. And then wrapping up, I'm trying to keep to time. Uh, I might use some chairs discretion and use one more minute. But I want to talk a little bit about the election experiences because this is another thing that stuck with us and why I think um, the referendum issue has not been resolved. So, like we're going to be asking you if you want to tell us, we asked people the story of your election day. Do you remember about what time you got up? Do you remember about what time you voted? What was your experience of the election like? Did you watch? Did you wait for the results? Do you remember what it was like when you first saw the results come in? How long did you wait up? When did you learn of the results? How did you feel? And that's, that's basically what this little bit is about. Um, nobody had problems voting, and but everybody was anxious, basically. Um, yes voters, so this would happen, our groups were in December, so it was a little ways after. And I'm not going to read all these out in the interest of time, so you can go ahead and stop paying attention to me and just read the comments. But what really came across was how, what a blow, an emotional blow that this had been. Now, I'd say I'm, I'm formally, a pol I did democratic politics in the U.S., and I definitely know what it's like to put your heart and soul in campaign and lose and how just gutting that is. But I also know that when you win, there's elation. Um, so we have a depression side. Was there elation on the other side? That's the next slide. But you can see that these were, we, there are stories of you know, people just talking about how depressed they were. The word depression came up you know, several times. And um, people, uh, one person mentioned about the kids, the kids in their family were crying on the day that yes went down because they were really hoping for independence. So it's, I don't know that many kids cry, I know kids cry for sporting events. I don't think a lot of kids cry if Labour or Conservative win or lose. So this is clearly a level of emotion that we haven't really seen, you know, in comparison, my analysis as a political scientist. In terms of the no voters, happy but you muted. Um, I would actually even say relieved more than happy. Um, but some people felt like they knew how it was going to going to go. And similar, it wasn't. There wasn't that sort of huge elation. One person who was quite intense said that she was so close initially, she felt sick, but that she got up the next day and saw that it went by, and it was like Christmas morning for her. But she was the most enthusiastic of, of all our participants. Um, the one that kind of gets me, though, to be honest, um, because it maybe puts a little bit of a happy, you know, like happy thing on what is otherwise been a, a really emotionally heavy presentation that we've given you. 
is um, the, the bottom story of, of one woman who voted in and had to travel down to the, um, the south part of, of in England to see her family. And they got up very early in the morning and followed the result. And her, she and her five-year-old grandson snuck downstairs and turned on the tally, and it came out that that no had won the day. And the five-year-old like screamed and ran upstairs to his parents saying, Nana's still part of the United Kingdom. Uh, so again, these are it wasn't just the borders of Scotland that felt the emotional ramifications of this decision. It's touched families across the country. And, and I think that's why we um, really wanted to present this information because we found it quite powerful. Okay, so in terms of wrapping this up, what does this evidence indicate to us? We really think that this shows how the political values and norms are really, on this issue, were deeply embedded in people's lived experiences in their lives. And then the referendum campaign gave greater voice to these values because it wasn't about an election about simple, you know, complicated policies or choosing between parties. It was a simple yes or no. But that also meant people had to pick a side. And that emotion, I'm sorry, that decision obviously had emotional consequences for our participants. Although the political situation was the referendum, and that is over and done with, um, these personal issues and emotions obviously aren't over and done with. And in our view, the reason why this issue hasn't been meaningfully resolved is because it's those deeper issues that are still un um, unaddressed. And then on this basis, we conclude that both yes and no voters expected another referendum at some point in the future. And when we asked in all of our groups, basically, I was like, do you think there's going to be another referendum? One person said no, but it didn't matter if it was yes or no or activists. Everyone thought this issue is not over, and I think it's not. I think my my personal saying is it's not because the legal issues aren't over; it's because the interpersonal issues are resolved. Uh, thank you.